Turn to Colossians chapter 4, Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 17. We've been talking today about servant leadership, and um, one of the things that I think has happened during the whole COVID situation is that we have lost opportunities for fellowship and other things that we have. I'm, I'm looking forward to when we don't have to wear the mask when we sing in just a couple of weeks here, and I'm looking forward to more people getting back into church, but uh, we've lost that fellowship. And that's one of the reasons we're having this week coming up where we're really encouraging you to get back together. And we've scheduled some things that you can be a part of. We've got the uh, the pizza night on Monday night at our house at six o'clock. And uh, just come and join us, bring some pizza and salad, and we'll have floats and just enjoy some fellowship together. On Tuesday night, we're gonna do Tuesday at Tuesdays, uh, to get together at Ruby Tuesdays. Uh, now, I wanna make this clear, I'm not paying. Okay, I'm paying for me, but not for you. Uh, you got to pay for your own. Uh, but we'll gather together and just enjoy a night out uh, without having to, uh, uh, just to have the vaccine cards and all the rest of it. And then on Friday, uh, on Saturday, we have a, a hike scheduled at 10 o'clock. And then on Saturday evening or afternoon, we're going to have a, a cookout at our house. We'll provide the hamburgers and hot dogs, and you guys bring the side dishes and desserts and, and salads and such. And, and, um, and we're just looking forward to a good time. But I'm hoping that others of you will also maybe have a, a, a group activity in your area. You live out at Eva or live in AMR or out of Hickam. They say, hey, let's all get together at this park or somebody's house. And, or maybe just invite a couple families over to your home. And, and not just the ones you've always had before, but other ones as well. And it's important we get back together in fellowship. But it's also, as we get out of the COVID, we're gonna be able to do more as a church. And that means there needs to be more that we need to do as well. Uh, we've added Sunday school, which means more nursery workers and, and more uh, children's ministry workers. And, and so it, it adds more to what we need help with. And, uh, and so I wanna challenge you that you need to be involved in the ministry at Ohana Baptist Church. And in Colossians chapter four, and verse number 17, it says, and say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Let's bow for a prayer. Father, we pray that we would receive our ministry from you, that we would know this is my ministry. This is what you've called me to do in serving you within the local church. And as we have an opportunity now to expand our ministries and to open up new doors of opportunity that you would help each person here tonight and those watching online as well uh, to commit to be involved in the ministry, to find out what your calling is for them. And as we get involved in the ministry, that we would use that opportunity to serve one another as well. So we pray that you bless this message tonight as we study your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we say to be involved in the ministry. What we're talking about is just an opportunity to serve the Lord. And there's many different ministries that you can be involved in at Ohana Baptist Church. Uh, and every one of them is important. Every one of them is significant. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verses 14 through 24, the Bible uh, the, the, uses the illustration of the, the church is like a body. And every part of the body is important. We sometimes think, well, this part is more important than the other part. Uh, if you want to know how important uh, different parts of your body are, try hitting your little finger with a hammer sometime, and you'll find out how very important your little finger is. And um, every part of the body is critical. Every part of the body is important. And sometimes we get this idea that, that my ministry is a mini ministry. In other words, it's no big, I just work in the nursery, or I, I just help out in the office, or I, I'm just a greeter, or whatever else it might be. But there is no mini ministry. Uh, you, you don't just work with children. It's a, it, it is a calling of God. Look at Luke chapter 18. Our children's ministries are, are very important. Our children need people that are committed to them, whether it is in the nursery or it's in the children's classes or wherever else it might be. In Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17, the Bible says they brought unto him also infants that he would touch them. But when his disciples saw it, they rebuked them. But Jesus called them, all, called them unto him and said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God is like a little child, like a little child shall no wise, um, no wise enter therein. And, and Jesus said, Listen, children's ministry is not a mini ministry, it is an important ministry. 
and we need to provide a ministry to the, to the babies in the nursery where they have someone that's going to take care of them, where the parents can come and, and sit and listen and not be distracted, where other people are not distracted by them. Uh, babies are a distraction. Uh, not just when they cry, uh, but even when they're cute. There's many times I'm standing up here preaching and uh, there's somebody sitting behind a lady with a baby and she's got that little baby on her shoulder and the person behind them, instead of listening to my message, they're going, making faces at that baby and paying attention to the baby and they're not paying attention to me because babies are cute and, uh, and they can be distraction. And what a blessing it is when we have people that are committed to ministering within the nursery. And then the children's ministries where the kids can go and learn the word of God and be taught uh, about the Bible. I was talking to, past, uh, to Brother Jerome tonight and in charge of our children's ministry and he's looking for material that can teach these kids doctrine. He says, these kids are smart. And, and they want to learn, and I want to teach them doctrine. I don't want to just teach them the Bible stories. I want to teach them the Bible, the Word of God. And, and it's an important ministry that we have with children. It's not a ministry ministry, mini ministry. How, how many of you got saved as a child? Raise your hand. How many got saved as a child? Look around. It's a lot of people. And, and it's a great opportunity to reach them for Christ in their early uh, years, in their years where they're tender to the Lord. And sometimes we think, well, I just work with children, or I just work in the office. In 1 Corinthians 14, 40, it says, let all things be done decently and in order. In verse number 33, it says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. And uh, there's, a, there's a big administrative process involved in everything we do, and there's a, there's a technical need that is there, and it takes up a huge portion of our time. And when people are willing to volunteer to help out and to be working in the office and to help out with uh, busy work that might seem like it's not important, but it is, it makes a difference. Or maybe you think, well, I'm just a greeter. Uh, the greeter ministry in Psalms 84 and verse 10 is, for a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Uh, what a blessing it is to be someone who is the first one to greet a visitor. I, I can't tell how many times that I, 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 I followed up on somebody visit the church and how many times they'll say, well, that, that person that was down there at the table greeting me or the person in the welcome center uh, just made me feel so welcome. And, and what, an important, what an important ministry it is. Most people decide on a church in the first three to seven minutes that they're on that property. Long before they hear the pastor preach, long before they hear the, the, the music, long before anything else happens, they've already decided if this is the church for me by the greeters, by those who welcome them. It's not a mini ministry. Uh, sometimes we think, well, I just work in the sound room or I just work in the production or, or the videos and, and all of that. But that is so important. Romans ten seventeen says, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If, if they can't hear what I'm preaching, then it's not going to change their lives. Whether it's here in the auditorium or whether it's uh, somewhere out there on in virtual land, it is so important that we have uh, a, a good presentation of the word of God. Or maybe you think, well, I just sing on the worship team. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20 and verses 21 and 22, it says, And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of, his, of holiness as they went out before the army, and to say, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise the Lord, praise the Lord set ambushments, and they were smitten. You know, you, if you're like me, you've probably been watching what's going on in Ukraine and how they're, they're fighting the invasion. And I saw the other day that there was a group about four or five of the opera singers that were out there in the street and they were singing the Ukrainian national anthem. And can you imagine if they went to those opera singers and said, listen, we're getting ready to go fight against these tanks here and we want you to lead the way singing. Uh, could you imagine what their reaction would be to that? Uh, I don't think that's what I'd want to be doing out in front of those tanks and, and be in front of all that, in between all that battle. But that's exactly what happened here in Second Chronicles. They led the way through worship. And uh, the music team leads the way in worship. And, and they're so critical and so important. And I want to challenge you that whether it's the sign waving ministry, whether you come down and work on the building or, or whether you're involved, whatever ministry you're involved in, there is no mini ministry. Every ministry has an impact. Every ministry makes a difference. 
And what you need to do is you need to find out from the Lord, what is your ministry? What is it that God wants me to do here at Ohana Baptist Church? And, and to find that ministry where you can serve the Lord. Because nothing is small when God is in it. Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 10, it says, For who hath despised the day of small things? What had happened is they had built the original temple, and then it was, it was destroyed. And they decided later on to rebuild the temple, but it, it was not as big and as beautiful as the original temple. And a lot of the people remembered that original temple. They, they wept because they remembered the beauty and the grandeur of it. And God said, listen, there's nothing small with God. It's not the size of the temple. It's the size of our God. And we need to realize that your ministry is not a mini ministry because there's nothing small with God. Your ministry is only as small as your vision. Your ministry is only as small as your vision. In Proverbs 29, 18, it says, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. I want to challenge you to ask God to give you a vision for your ministry. And, and when you become a part of that ministry, whether you're teaching the children, whether you're out sign waving, whether you're uh, helping out in the nursery or whatever, to ask God, say, God, give me a vision. Help me to see this as the great opportunity to serve you and to serve others as well. Small people make for a bigger God. In John chapter 3 and verse number 30, it says, he must increase but I must decrease. It's not about how big we are. It's about how big our God is and the impact that we can have in serving our Lord. And what we need to do is we need to do our best and God will do the rest. As we've been preaching through these values that we have as a church, one of the challenges we have is that we do everything with excellence. We do everything to the best of our ability before the Lord, to give our all to the Lord. In Colossians 3.17, it says, and whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. In verse number 23, and whatsoever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord and not unto men. You know, when I go out there sign waving, I want to give my best to the Lord. When, when I'm up here preaching, I want to give my best to the Lord. Whatever you're doing, whatever ministry you're involved with, you ought to want to do it to the best ability that you have for God's glory. And when we're serving the Lord to our best ability, God will do the rest. He'll do amazing things. There is no mini ministry. Nothing is small when God is in it. Go over to Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. Would ministry, you and I need to raise the minimum standard. Uh, right now, in the legislature are talking about raising the minimum wage. You know, it's going to go up. Well, we need to raise the minimum standard. In Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, it says, We then that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but has written the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. See, we need to realize that, this, that God wants us to give our best as unto him. He wants us to, to raise that standard. Uh, one of the things that we as a church need to always be doing is saying we can do better. We can do better. The Bible talks about loving more and more. Uh, and everything we do, we can always do better. We can always do more. And we want to, we ought to want to do our best for the Lord and to be that minimum standard that everybody else has to rise to. In Philippians chapter two, turn over there with me, if you would. Philippians chapter two and verses 19 through 22. Philippians chapter two and verses 19 through 22. We talked about Timothy this morning being a certain disciple. He had a great testimony, and this is the reason why. It says in verse number 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, and not the things which are Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him, therefore, I hope to send presently, so soon as I shall see how it will go with me. You see, Timothy, he set the standard. 
He set the standard of how you ought to do things. The Bible says he, he did everything to the best of his ability. He, he naturally cared for their state. He, he didn't seek his own. He thought the things of Christ and sought out others. He, he would do it as well or as better than Paul would do. Uh, he was that, that standard that everybody else had to live up to. Years ago, we had a guy in the church that was a, he had applied for a job at the shipyard and, and uh, he got the job and he went down for his training beforehand. And he said, pastor, you won't believe what they, they taught me in the training. I don't know if they still do this or not, but this is what had happened to him is when they were in the training, they talked about, this is your job. This is what you're supposed to do. And this is all you're supposed to do. He said, if you've got nothing to do, do not pick up a broom and start swimming, sweeping. If you've got nothing to do, do not, do not try to go out and help somebody else out. And, and he raised his hand and says, why? Because he said, you make everybody else look bad. You see, that's not the way it ought to be with the church. We ought to, we ought to say, listen, I want to be a part of that. I want to be the one that sets the standard everybody else is going to live up to. I want to be that, that standard for Ohana Baptist Church. Your goal in your ministry ought to be to make everyone else in Ohana look bad compared to you. I mean, it just ought to be, I'm going to do this job so well that I'm going to set a standard. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 1 Corinthians chapter 8, I'm sorry, it should be 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 through 5. The Bible says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God, bestowed in the churches of Macedonia, how that in great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we'd receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves unto the Lord and unto us by the will of God. See, Paul said, listen, here's your standard. Here's what you need to live up to. Look at the churches of Macedonia. That's the kind of church you need to be. That's the kind of giving. That's the kind of serving. That's, that's, that's the way you ought to give of yourself as well. And, and, and whatever ministry you're in, you ought to make it your goal that I am the one that's going to set the standard for this ministry. I'm, I'm going to do a job that everybody else has to live up to that. Somebody once said it this way, a maximum effort should be always be your minimum standard. Whether you're out sign waving or whether you're working in the nursery and changing a diaper or whether you're mopping the bathroom floor or whether you're out greeting folks as they come to church or guiding somebody in the parking lot, doesn't matter what you're doing. A maximum effort should always be your minimum standard. Go over to Luke chapter 17. Luke chapter 17. I have another message I preached about different kinds of servants in the Bible. There's many different words for servants, and some of them were uh, words that would define somebody like a hired servant. Uh, another one would define somebody that's like a, almost like a waiter to serve tables. And then there's another one, another, there's different words that are there in the Bible for servant. It's a very interesting study to look at and, and determine what kind of servant. Some servants are in it for what they get out of it. You know, it, it's like, remember the parable of the, the, the laborers, how that, uh, you know, like you see in the mainland, a lot of places you go to Home Depot and there's people standing outside Home Depot looking for work. And so if you come up and you've got a project, you can hire one of them to come work for you. And so these guys were waiting around looking for work and a, and a, and a farmer came and said, you can come work in my fields. And he got some early in the morning and some later and then another group later, and another one only an hour before they quit. And uh, he negotiated with him and he said, oh, I'll pay you a penny, which was a day's wage in that day. And, and, uh, and, and they got out there in the field and were working. And when the all's done, the, the people worked only one hour. They got their penny. And all the rest of them thought, well, if they got a penny for working an hour, what are we going to get? And they got a penny too. And, and the reason they only got a penny is because that's what they negotiated for. In other words, they're serving for what's in it for me. And I'm only serve if I get something out of it. And God said, that's the kind of serving you're being, that that's what you're going to get. And, 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 and so we need to look at what kind of servant we are. Are we there to serve unconditionally? Are we there to give ourselves? And Luke chapter 17 and verses 7 through 10, it says, But which of you having a servant plowing or feeding cattle will say unto him by and by, when he, came from, when he come from the field, go and sit down to meet? And will not rather say unto him, Make ready wherewith I may sup, and gird thyself, and serve me, till I have eaten and drunken, and afterwards thou shalt eat and drink. 
that, that they, does he thank that servant because he did the things which were commanded him? I, I trow not, or I think not. So likewise you, when you shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which was our duty to do. See, don't be unprofitable servants. Be servants that are going to do what you're, not only your duty to do, but of above and beyond your duty. You haven't started ministry until you do what is expected of every church member. One of the things I teach my staff and I've taught and said to them before is that we're not paid to do what we ask our church members to do. My staff's not paid to be in church on Sunday. That's not part of their hours of work because I don't, I don't pay any of you to come to church and I'm not paying them to do what I'm asking you to do. You know, my not, staff's not paid to have their daily devotions. My staff's not paid to, to, to go out on that first hour or so of visitation because that's what I think every church member should be doing. You see, we, we need to set a minimum standard of just what we should be doing in serving the Lord. See, the problem is the normal Christian life is not the normal Christian life today. What is the normal Christian life as defined by the Bible is not the normal Christian life that most Christians live. We don't even live up to the minimum standard. And, and we need to be that, that we need to live to, up to the standard of God's word in that way. Go over to Acts chapter 3. Acts chapter 3. Have you ever gone to the mini mart? You know, they call it 7 Elevens or whatever else. That, why do people go to a mini mart? They don't go there because of the quality of the food, although their spam which should be is, is pretty good, some of them. They, they don't go there because the food prices are great. They're usually a lot higher, are they not? What's the main reason why people go to a mini mart? Convenience. Convenience and get to soda, all right? Uh, or coffee, brother, serious, get your coffee. But uh, convenience, they, they go there because it's close, it's easy to get in, easy to get out of, and it's convenient. Let me say something here. You are the closest and most convenient person in this church to others. You may not have everything that somebody else might have. You may not have all the answers, but you have what people need because you're available to them. See, I can't be available to everybody in the church. Pastor Caleb can't, Pastor Ensner can't. And that part of our ministry is ministering to individuals, being the mini marts of the church, being available to others. In Acts chapter three, verses one through 10, Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer being the ninth hour. And there was a certain man there who was lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate, which he was called beautiful to ask alms of them to enter the gate, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter fastened his eyes upon him, which John said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. You know, you know what he's talking about? You know, when you got somebody out there, you know, you got, you got these guys on the street corners by the lights, you know, where they're collect, you know, they're out there waiting for money. And, and what do you, what do you try to avoid doing? Make eye contact. Cause as soon as you make eye contact, it's like, they're ready. You know, you're going to give me money and you know, don't want to make that eye contact. Well, here, Peter makes eye contact with him. And the man says he's expecting this. The Bible says he's expecting something of them. Then Peter said, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. See, what you and I need to do is to give people what they need. And people are looking to you expecting something. And each of you, we're, we're having this get back, get back together week. And my wife and I have been talking about, we're going to have one night, we're going to have people over for pizza. We're going to have another night, we're going to have over for a cookout. And we're planning to be there for Ruby Tuesdays and all. But you know what? We just can't do it with everybody. We can't be there. We need each of you to realize that there's people that are looking to you to greet them, to welcome them, to invite them into your home, to reach out to them. 
to minister to them, to be the mini marts of the church where you're accessible. See, ministry, right there in the center of ministry is the I, the I of ministry, which means personal possession or ownership. Take ownership of your ministry. Go to Exodus chapter 32. Exodus chapter 32. And look at verse number seven. Exodus chapter 32 and verse number seven. Exodus 32 and verse number seven. It says, The Lord said unto Moses, Go thee down, for the people which thou uh, broughtest out of the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Now, you remember when God called Moses, Moses was very reluctant. I mean, he argued with God. Remember there in the, when the bush was on fire and he said, God, I, I don't know how to talk. I don't have, they're not going to listen to me. And he argued with God. He really didn't want that ministry. It always kind of makes me chuckle when people uh, get up to give their testimony when they're leaving Ohana Baptist Church. Uh, many people got up and says, you know, um, I didn't want to teach a Sunday school class, but pastor came and made me do that. And, and now I love it. You know, they took on, it became their ministry, even though I had to kind of twist their arm a little bit. Look at verse number 10. Now, therefore, let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that I may consume them and I will make of thee a great nation. Now, they were rebelling against God and God said, listen, I'm just done with these people. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring down lightning from heaven and I'm just going to wipe them all out. and We'll start over. You can be the father of a great nation and, and we'll start over with you. In verse 11, and Moses besought the Lord his God. And so, Lord, what, why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people, which thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? And let's skip down to verses 31 and 32. And Moses returned unto the Lord and said, Oh, this people uh, have sinned a great sin and made them gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. Wow, what a statement. He said, Lord, forgive them. And if not, take my name out of the book. Now, we know we can't lose our salvation. But what that tells me is that Moses as reluctant as he was, as much as the people rebelled, not only against God, but against him. I mean, he got it, left and right. As much problems as he had, he had taken ownership. These are my people. Now, you can go too far with that. In Numbers chapter 20 and verse 10, it says, And Moses and Aaron gathered the congregation together before the rock, and he said unto them, Here now, you rebels, must we fetch you water out of this rock? Now, who was it that brought the water forth in the first place? It was God. And, and you can get to the point where you think this is my ministry and we forget this God's ministry. And I don't want you to do that. But at the same time, God wants us to take ownership. You know, as your pastor, I talk about God owns us. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. What, know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have, your, which you have, uh, just, I missed it, go to 1 Corinthians 6, 19, 20. If I misquoted to start with, I can't get it back right there. So let's get back over there. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. It says, what, know you not that your body is a temple of the Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own, for you're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. See, God owns us. And we ought to give him our best. We looked at Colossians chapter 3. What's there to do? Do heart is to the Lord, to give your best unto the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 16, 15, it says, I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that is the first fruits of Acacia, that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. You know, you think of the word addiction. You, you can't live without the alcohol or the drugs or the tobacco or whatever else it is. And here's a man that said, I cannot live without serving the Lord. I'm so thankful for people that addict themselves to the ministry and say, this is my ministry. And I, I don't want to go a week without doing this. I, I, this is what God's called me to do. But here's the interesting thing. God said, I'm going to destroy the people. And what did Moses say? Don't. Now, as your pastor, I, I, I want you to obey the Lord, Right? But you know there's times that even God doesn't want you to obey him. 
Let me give you some examples. In First Corinthians, I'm sorry, in, in Exodus chapter 32, we look at Moses and he said, Lord, if, if you're, you know, you're going to kill these people, then take, take away my, blot my name out of the book which thou hast written. In Jeremiah chapter 14, verse 11, the Bible says, Then said the Lord unto me, Jeremiah, pray not for this people for their good. You know what Jeremiah did later on in that same chapter? What did he do? He prayed for him. God said, don't pray for him. And what's Jeremiah do? He prays for him. He didn't obey God. In Luke chapter 13, the, the Lord said, hey, that tree that's not bearing fruit, cut it down. What's the dresser of the field say? Give me one year. One year to dress it, to, to fertilize it, to dig out the weeds and to water it and see if I can get to produce fruit. In Matthew chapter 9, verses 31 and 30 and 31, it says, and their eyes were open. And Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See that no man know it. But they, when they were departed, spread abroad his fame to all the country. God said, Don't tell anybody. And what do they do? They go and tell everybody. God tells us, Go tell everybody. What do we do? We don't tell anybody. 1 John chapter 5, verses 16 to 17. If any man see his brother sin, a sin which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is a sin not unto death. Now, the sin unto death is a sin, I believe, where somebody can sin to the point that God says, you know what, enough is enough. You're coming to heaven right now. And God, because we can die early because of our sin, and God takes us home to heaven. And there's a point where somebody can cross a line, and no matter how much you pray for them, nothing's going to change in that situation. But you know what? I think most of us give up way too easily. We stop praying for that unsaved friend or relative. We stop praying for that person that's away from the Lord. We give up on them. I was talking to somebody today, and they got saved uh, when they were a young man, I think around 21 years old, and was faithful in church serving the Lord. But then some things happened in his life, and he got away from the Lord. But now he's back. And I thank God for people that don't stop praying. God said, don't pray for them if they've committed sin unto death. But you know what? I don't know when that point, when they cross that line. I don't know when it's too late. So why stop praying for them? You see, you got to take ownership. And sometimes taking ownership, I don't want you to disobey the Lord. That's clear. But in every one of these cases, they contradicted God and God didn't judge them for that. Maybe he's using reverse psychology. I don't know. But we need to stay faithful. You can go out sign waving for weeks and see no results. Some days you go out there and if sign waving is the same as, I, I feel like one of those beggars out there, nobody wants to make eye contact. It, it's, it's fun when you're sign waving because you're out there waving to people. And my goal is to get them to wave back. And there's some people right away they see they're waving away because that's their personality or they're glad to see a church out there. But then there's other people that they're driving down the road and they're trying not to look at you. And I found this, if I can make eye contact, they have to wave. It's like that reluctant, okay, you know? It's like I gotta do it. And that makes it fun for me. I, my challenge is I'm, I'm gonna get that guy to wave at me, you know, and, and, and get him to respond back. You know, why not? You see, we're so reluctant to serve the Lord, but there's so much we can do to serve God. And just making it our goal in that way. Ownership doesn't mean you have all of the answers or all of the responsibility. But it does mean you need to take that ownership and responsibility. You know, when you're on a ship, it's either sink or swim. And we need to realize that this is my ministry. This is what God has called me to do. And so I need to fulfill that ministry. I need to be addicted to that ministry. I need to do that ministry so God could write about me like he does about Timothy. That does a, as good or better job than I could do. And I need to do my best in that ministry to make it work. You know, you've all seen the poster, there's no I in team. 
In Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2, it says, I beseech Iodius, I beseech Nick, that they be the same mind in the Lord. We started a project many years ago called the Hookie Lao Project, and our goal was to help start 10 new churches in 10 years. You know what that basically we did? We started competition. Because now there's more churches for people to go to than just Ohana. But we're not in competition. We're in cooperation. And the same thing is in the church. We're not in competition. We're in cooperation. We're together. You notice this next day, they've gotten this irritation, this problem between them. And who did it, what did it affect? It affected the ministry of the church. You know, there is an I in Christ. And let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And there is an I in his. And what you need to make sure is I am right in the center of the Holy Spirit, his. Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk with wine, or his next but be filled with the Spirit. What we don't need is we don't need the eye of pride. Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit for a fall. It's not about me getting all the credit. It's not about everybody seeing what I am doing. And we don't need the eye of sin. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 30. The Bible says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you're sealed on the day of redemption. Second Thessalonians 5.19, quench not the Spirit. We need to be we Christians. I've showed you this before, but go to Acts chapter 16. One of the things I love about reading the Bible is, is you can look for all the little nuances, all the, the little things that can change the story and open it up to you in so many ways. And here in Acts chapter 16, Paul is at a, a transition point in his life. He's just not up until this point. Really, he, he knew where he's going next. He had it all mapped out and everything. And, and, and now he wasn't sure where to go. In Acts chapter 16 and verse number 6, it's now when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And then I want you to go down to verse number 10. See the subtle difference here. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathered the Lord had called for us to preach the gospel unto them. Up until that point, it was about they, they, they. But then it changed to we. And Luke said, this is not just Paul's ministry. This is my ministry. I want to be a part of this. And, and we need to be we Christians. This is our church. This is our ministry. This is our opportunity. And we ought to have that heart. Ministry ends with the word try. Go over to James chapter 1. I'm going to tell you right now, if you get involved in the ministry, you're going to, you're going to have trying of your patience. Working in the nursery, that will try your patience. Working with children, that will try your patience. Working with other people, that will try your patience. In James chapter 1, verses 2 through 8, My brother, encounter all joy when you fall in diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect word, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God to give it to all men liberally, to breathe not, it should be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavers like the wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his way. I have found that some of the greatest times of growth in my life have been the times when my patience was tried. And that'll happen in ministry. You get frustrated. Working with volunteers is tough. Because you have nothing to hold over the head. If, you, if I pay you a paycheck, I don't have to pay you if you don't do your job. But volunteers, you don't have that luxury. And it's trying sometimes working with other people and trying to coordinate things together. And people will try your patience. Look at Exodus chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. Exodus chapter 18, verses 18 through 20. Thou will surely wear away both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it. 
thyself alone. Hearken now unto my voice. I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to Godward, that thou mayest bring the, their causes unto God. And thou shalt teach them ordinances and laws, and they shall show them the way where, wherein they may, must walk, and that the, the work that they must do. One of the problems that Moses ran to is, is frustrations with people. And it is tough working with people. And, and you can blame the people. That's what Saul did in 1 Samuel 15, 24. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I transgressed the commandment of the Lord and, I, and the, thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. You can blame the people. They made me do it. Or you can pray for them. In Exodus chapter 32, Moses prayed for the people. In 1 Samuel 12, 23, it says, Moreover for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Pray for those that you minister to. Ask God to bless them and guide them. Romans 12, 17, 18 says, Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. In other words, in ministry, you just got to try everything you can and see how you can reach out to others. Go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. I always get a little bit in trouble because people don't always understand what I'm trying to say here. But one of the things that I've learned over the years is that you don't want to try harder in most cases. In fact, one of the greatest reasons for failure is because people tried. And what I mean by that is that we, because we tried, we can excuse our failure. Well, I tried to get along with him, or I tried to do this, and I couldn't do it. And so we excuse ourselves because we tried. And often is, is we, we try, and it, it, we really don't. When my kids were little, I'd say, hey, go, go down here and look for this and bring it up here. And they'd come back about a minute later and say, I couldn't find it. Well, did you look for it? Yeah, I tried. And that was their excuse. I, I tell them, go back down there. Don't come back up until you find it. There's no trying here. Just do it. Now, again, I know if you jump off the top of the building, you're not going to fly, no matter how hard you try. I understand that. But trying is often an excuse for failure. In James chapter 1, verses 22 through 25, it says, But be you doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he's like unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. You see, a lot of times we don't try. We, we give up. We don't give it our best effort. In Numbers 13 and verse 30, it says, And Caleb stilled the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and possess it, for we are well able to overcome it. And we need to realize, I can do this. It's hard. Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 7 through 8, O Lord, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Thou art stronger than I, and hast prevailed. I am a derision daily. Everyone mocketh me, for since I spake, I cried out. I cried violence and spoil, because the word of the Lord was made a reproach unto me in derision daily. What Jeremiah is just saying here, I didn't know it was going to be this hard. 2 Timothy 3.12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's not always easy. Caleb had to wait 40 years for his mountain before he got it. Go to Luke chapter 9. We're going to close with this in one of the verse. Luke chapter 9. Look at verses 57 through 62. Luke chapter 9 and verse number 57. Luke 9 and verse number 57. It says, It came to pass, they went in the way. A certain man said, And Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto them, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. Jesus saith unto him, Let the dead bury their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go and bid them farewell, which are at my home, at home at my house. And Jesus said, it said, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. We've got all these excuses. 
I don't have time this week. You know, it, it, there's 101 excuses for not serving the Lord. But we've got to stop trying and say, you know what, I'm going to do this. I'm going to serve God. Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So I want to challenge you. What is the ministry that God has called you to fulfill? What's the ministry? And have you addicted yourself to the ministry? You know, I look around this church, and there's people in this church that have addicted themselves. I, I think of the Nordstrom's with the four- and five-year-old class, and they've just addicted themselves to it. They just love that ministry. they fulfilled that ministry in so many ways. I think people like the Smiths who are down there and, and Mike Sears who are down there every morning at that table to greet people and to welcome them to church and have addicted themselves to that ministry. I, I think of Rich Pileski who's taken on the sign waving and, and it's just a, it's a passion that he has. I think of people in the nursery and there's some of the ladies in the nursery that are just down there every week and they just, it's their ministry. It's their calling of God. I think of Brother Jerome and the children's ministry. He just, he does it because he loves God and he loves those kids. So what's your ministry? Where has God called you to serve? There's no many ministries. There's a place for you where God wants to use you. And I need to take ownership to become that minimum standard that everybody else has to live up to. There's certain people out sign waving that they're, they're just faithful and they're excited and enthusiastic. One of them, I think it was Pastor Andy. If you ever watched Pastor Andy on sign waving, he's hilarious. He, he's just fun. He's got a lot of things. He's a busy man, but he's addicted himself to the ministry. What about you? Stop trying and start doing. Let's bow in prayer.